May the peace and mercy of God be upon each and every one of you. Today's lecture focuses on the centuries that separate Prophet Jesus from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them both. Specifically, we will look at four primary issues, the interpretation of which divides contemporary Christianity from Islam. These issues are the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion event, the nature of Jesus, and the nature of God. In reviewing these four issues, each issue will be examined in turn and, where appropriate, will be traced along chronological trajectories. However, before beginning this endeavor, it should be noted that contrary to popular belief, early Christianity was not a single monolithic structure. There were many branches to early Christianity, and each local church, for example, the church at Corinth or the church at Jerusalem, was independent of every other church. Each church had its own ecclesiastical hierarchy and its own set of recognized scripture. Thus, the letter of Barnabas was recognized as scripture by the church at Alexandria. Some churches recognized the Gospel of Thomas and the Shepherd of Hermas, and other churches did not. In that regard, it should be noted that most of the apocryphal books that I'll be referencing later in the lecture were recognized by one or another of the early Christian source, the churches as being authoritative. And it was not until the sixth century that the books of the New Testament became almost completely standardized, although attempts at standardization had begun approximately two centuries before that, and although the East Syrian or Nestorian Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and the Coptic Church, to this day, continue to have New Testaments at variance with the rest of Christianity and with each other. Well, not only did the local churches of Christianity differ as to what was and was not recognized scripture, they also differed as to doctrine and dogma. Such differences were especially apparent when one considers the four issues under consideration today. As will be shown, there were branches of early Christianity that approached each one of these four issues in a manner quite consistent with Islamic interpretation and at variance with that of contemporary Christianity. Now it's quite outside of current time parameters to cover all of the different positions advanced by one or another early Christian church with regard to each of these four issues. As such, it's noted at the outset that the following review is highly selective and is not representative of the tremendous breadth of differing opinion that existed within the early Christian churches. Quite simply, it is not the intent of today's lecture to present the full range of opinion that existed within early Christianity, but only to highlight those early branches of Christianity that were more or less consistent with Islam's position on each of the four issues under consideration. In other words, the Islamic proposition that Jesus was a prophet of Islam and that the, the, re, and that the religion he taught was an earlier form of Islam more or less demands that one should be able to find residual traces consistent with Islamic teaching within the historical record of early Christianity. It is the purpose of today's lecture to begin to illuminate this Islamic residual with regard to each of the four issues under consideration. Quran chapter 3 verse 47 informs the reader that Jesus was appointed by God as a messenger to the, quote, children of Israel. In contrast, contemporary Christianity typically maintains that Jesus' mission and ministry were to the world at large. Nonetheless, there are several New Testament passages that appear to agree with the Islamic position that he was sent only to the children of Israel. For example, consider the following biblical verses. These twelve, 
that is the 12 disciples, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, or non-Jews, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, verses 5 through 6. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus reportedly answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We might also consider how the actual disciples of Jesus, as well as the immediate followers of those disciples, continue Jesus' ministry after the end of his earthly sojourn. However, at this point, we must interject a very important proviso that is often overlooked, even though known by most contemporary Christians. Namely, that Paul, a former Pharisee and rabbi, once known as Saul of Tarsus, was never a disciple of Jesus and apparently never even met Jesus during the latter's earthly ministry. In short, Paul, who was the foremost proponent of the concept of a universal ministry for Jesus, does not represent the tradition of the disciples and in fact was in frequent conflict with the Jerusalem church, which was the headquarters of the actual disciples of Jesus. This can be readily substantiated by turning to the New Testament. When he, Paul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Acts 9, verse 26. Other New Testament passages, for example, Acts 15, verses 1 through 5, Acts 21, verses 17 through 26, and Galatians 2, verses 1 through 9, dramatically illustrate that Paul, with his insistence on preaching to the Gentiles, was in frequent conflict with the Jerusalem church. Now, with regard to these three passages, it's instructive to note that both Acts and Galatians are Pauline documents and do not reflect the teachings of the Jerusalem church and of the actual disciples of Jesus. As an illustration of this Pauline bias, one can profitably examine Acts 21, verses 17 through 26, where the Pauline writer of this text attempts to show that the Jerusalem church supported Paul in the end. However, the fact of the matter was, as recorded in that very passage, the elders of the Jerusalem church made Paul undergo the temporary rites of being a Nazarite, meaning that he was made to purify himself and to pay penance for what he had been doing. Well, despite this Pauline bias, Acts does preserve a statement indicating what the actual disciples of Jesus and their immediate followers did when it came to preaching the message of Jesus. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. Acts 11, verse 19. 
In short, any serious student of early Christianity must recognize a fundamental divergence of thought between the Pauline Church with its message to the Gentiles and the Jerusalem Church of Jesus' actual disciples. The latter restricted its message to the children of Israel, continued to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, and did not even call themselves Christians, a term that first arose in the Gentile church in Antioch, as witnessed by Acts 11, verses 20 through 26. Many scholars of early Christianity, recognizing that the actual disciples of Jesus did not preach other than, other than to the children of Israel, referred to the Jerusalem church as being Jewish Christian. This Jewish Christian tradition continued after the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE. Such early Christian movements as the Ibionites, the Nazarenes, and the Elkasites appear to have represented this Jewish Christian tradition. In particular, we can point to the Ibionites, who were apparently established shortly after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, whereupon they fled from the vicinity of Jerusalem and spread to what is today Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt. Of note, the Ibionites continued as a viable movement within greater Christianity throughout the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. Likewise, the Nazarenes were known to have existed in greater Syria at least as late as the 4th century. Reviewing the preceding historical record, one finds evidence of a trajectory within early Christianity that can be traced back to the biblical books of Matthew and Acts and the Jerusalem church and that continued to exist well into at least the 4th century and that continued to restrict active preaching to the children of Israel. Of note, the groups represented by this longitudinal trajectory also firmly rejected the Pauline abrogation of the so-called Mosaic laws governing dietary restrictions, etc. In this way, these groups were also more or less consistent with Islam. Any student of comparative religion knows there are major similarities in the understanding of Jesus and Mary by Islam and early Christianity. However, when we consider the crucifixion event, we come to a fundamental discrepancy between Islam and modern Christianity. The Quran declares that Jesus was not crucified, even though his persecutors thought that they had crucified him. That they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not, nay, God raised him up unto himself, and God is exalted in power, wise. Quran 4, verses 157-158. The Quran says that Jesus was not crucified, a position in marked conflict with contemporary Christianity. Indeed, God saved Jesus and raised him up unto himself, a statement having parables with the ascension of Jesus as recorded in the Biblical Gospels of Mark, chapter 16, verse 9, and Luke, chapter 24, verses 50 to 51. For most contemporary Christians, indeed for most inhabitants of the Western world, it's almost unthinkable that anyone could seriously maintain that Jesus was not crucified. Such critics of Islam might even maintain that the alleged resurrection of Jesus is a matter of religious belief. But the crucifixion of Jesus is a matter of an unblemished historical record. However, as we shall soon see, the actual historical record 
is otherwise than we might expect. Outside of the New Testament and other early Jewish and Christian scriptural writings, there are only two references to Jesus being crucified in the entire historical record of the first and early second centuries. The first was made by Josephus ben Matthias, a first century Jewish historian, and the second by Tacitus, a first and second century Roman. Neither writer was present at the crucifixion event. For that matter, most biblical scholars maintain that none of the New Testament authors who wrote about the crucifixion event were actual witnesses to that event. Nonetheless, the skeptic of the Islamic position that Jesus was not crucified will rightly insist that any serious attempt to refute the crucifixion of Jesus must marshal an impressive array of documentation that there was serious controversy about whether or not Jesus was actually crucified. Where is that documentation? They may well ask. The answer is that it is to be found within the writings of early Christianity itself. In short, the discrepancy about the crucifixion event between Islam and contemporary Christianity obscures the fact that many branches of early Christianity maintain quite adamantly that it was not Jesus Christ who was crucified. This can be verified by examining the writings of the so-called apostolic fathers of the early Christian churches, the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, and even the New Testament itself. The writings of the Apostolic Fathers frequently noted that there were Christian sects that rejected the proposition that Jesus had been crucified. Such references can be found in the writings of Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Hippolytus. Together these Apostolic Fathers represent a veritable who's who of early Christianity. As a specific example, we can turn to the Trallians, a book authored by Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, who died around the year 110. In referring to the crucifixion event, Ignatius wrote that there were Christians of his day who denied that Jesus was crucified in reality, but was crucified only in appearance or in illusion. In considering this statement from Ignatius, one must acknowledge that he could not be attacking a belief among Christians that did not, in fact, exist. His attack against those early Christians who believed that Jesus' crucifixion was only illusory demonstrates the existence of that belief among Christians at least as early as 110, the date of Ignatius' death. Further, the fact that Ignatius even bothered to attack this doctrine suggests that that belief was quite widespread by at least 110. The fact that many branches of early Christianity maintain that it was not Jesus Christ who was crucified can also be readily verified by considering the so-called New Testament Apocrypha. For example, the Apocalypse of Peter 81 through 82 maintained that Jesus was crucified only in appearance, not in reality, with the one who was crucified being a substitute or simulacrum of Jesus. Likewise, the second treatise of the great Seth, 55 through 56, stated it was not Jesus who was crucified, but Simon, presumably Simon of Cyrene, who is identified in the biblical gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as being the person who carried Christ's cross for him. This position that it was Simon of Cyrene who was crucified in place of Jesus was a cardinal tenet of that early Christian group known as the Celadians, which flourished in Egypt during the second century and which claimed to have received this message directly from Glaucus, the translator of Peter, one of the twelve disciples. Additionally, the Acts of John 97 through 101 reported that the crucifixion of Jesus was an illusion. 
However, it is not just within the so-called apocryphal writings that one finds evidence that it was not Jesus who was crucified. The Biblical Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 11 through 26, tell us about Jesus being before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, where he is to be tried. Now, according to the passage, Pilate didn't want to sentence Jesus, so he gave the crowd a choice between two prisoners. He would free the one they wanted of the two. Now, according to most versions of the Bible that you pick up and will read, Pilate said something like this, Whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus, who was called the Messiah, or Barabbas? And the crowd says, Give us Barabbas. And so Pilate releases Barabbas, and Jesus, who was called the Messiah, was taken away and crucified. The problem with most versions of the Bible is they do not go back to the earliest scriptural source. However, the New Revised Standard Version does. And if we go back to the original text material with it, we can quote from the New Revised Standard Version. There's a crucial one-word difference in the text. So Pilate says to the crowd, Whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus, who is called the Messiah, or Jesus Barabbas? Whoops, wait, what's going on here? We have two men named Jesus. So who's who? Well, maybe we can figure that out by looking at two key words, Messiah and Barabbas. Messiah, or Mashiach in Hebrew, simply means the anointed. That's all it means. You pick up the Bible and you look at the Old Testament, you're going to find all sorts of people being called the anointed, or Mashiach, or Messiah. Who were the anointed of Israel? Occasionally prophets, the high priest of Judaism, but we know this person wasn't one of the high priests because we have the list of high priests from Josephus and he's not on it. And thirdly, someone who is claiming to be king of Israel. Of course, that would have necessitated leading a revolt against Rome, which was a capital offense punishable by crucifixion. So Jesus the Messiah, we might remember that the Gospels tell us that uh, Pilate had a sign put over this person's head that said, King of the Jews. So Jesus the Messiah, apparently, was claiming to be king, which was a treasonable act resulting in crucifixion. What about Barabbas? Jesus Barabbas. Well, the important thing here is, Barabbas is not a name. Barabbas is a patronymic. You know, like Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him. Ibn Abdullah is the patronymic. Bar in Aramaic is like Ibn in Arabic. Bar means the son of. So we have Jesus, the son of Abbas. However, we're still not done. Because Abbas is not a name. Abbas is an Aramaic noun that needs to be translated. Unfortunately, the biblical translators aren't quite brave enough to do it yet. But if you look at a good biblical commentary, you'll find this information. So, I'm going to translate Abbas for you. But let's go back and repeat the whole scenario and I'll make the appropriate translation. So Pilate says to the crowd, Whom do you wish that I release unto you? Jesus who is called the Messiah, or Jesus the Son of the Father? Abbas, Father. The crowd says, Give us the Son of the Father, and Pilate releases Jesus the Son of the Father, and Jesus who is called the Messiah is taken away and crucified. Does this perhaps explain why Pontius Pilate was canonized as a saint by the Coptic Christian Church? 
Does one justify sainthood for the man who condemned Jesus or for the man who released him? Certainly Matthew raises the very real question of who is actually... Certainly Matthew raises a very, very real question as to who was actually crucified. However, if Jesus was not crucified, what does this say about the Christian doctrine of the atonement in the blood? That is, forgiveness of sin based upon Christ's crucifixion. After all, was not the crucifixion the crowning pinnacle of Jesus' divine mission? Was it not an absolutely indispensable part of his divine work? Well, what did Jesus reportedly say about this? His answer appears to be reported in a prayer attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of John. Of note, John places this prayer prior to the crucifixion event, before the crucifixion event. And let me quote from that prayer. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. John 17, verses 3 through 4. I finished the work that you gave me to do and did so prior to any crucifixion event. As reported by John, Jesus specifically excluded the later crucifixion event as being part of his work that you gave me to do. In summary, it is clear that there were branches of early Christianity that, like Islam, maintained it was not Jesus who was crucified. Islam holds that Jesus was a man, but one who was selected by God to be a prophet and messenger. Despite Islam's adherence to the virgin birth of Jesus, Islam maintains that Jesus was created by God, not begotten by him. Say he is God, the one and only, God, the eternal absolute. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Quran 112, verses 1 through 4. She, that is Mary, said, O my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He, the angel, said, even so, God creates what he wills. When he has decreed a plan, he but says to it, Be, and it is. The similitude of Jesus before God is as that of Adam. He created him from dust and said to him, Be, and he was. Around 3, verses 47 to 59. When considering the issue of the nature of Jesus within early Christianity, one is immediately confronted with the major differences that existed among the various early Christian churches. At the risk of oversimplifying the ways in which early Christianity answered the nature of Jesus, it can be grouped into three broad categories. One, Jesus was God. Two, Jesus was man and God simultaneously. And three, Jesus was a man, although one who was an instrument of God. The first position, that Jesus was God, denies the humanity of Jesus. This position was present, represented in early Christianity by various forms of Christian Gnosticism, especially by Docetism. The Docetist position was, that Jesus did not have a real or material body, but only a phantom or apparent body. As such, the docetists maintained that Jesus could not have suffered and died on the cross because he didn't have a physical body to begin with. Likewise, because he had no physical body, there could have been no resurrection. The second position, that Jesus was both God and man simultaneously, is the one that has evolved into the typical and orthodox doctrine of contemporary Christianity. That he is both divine and human at the same time, with that divinity and humanity, this is the official position, 
being neither mixed nor separated. Figure that one out if you can. The third position, that Jesus was man, although one standing in a special relationship with God, is represented in early Christianity by the various adoptionist theologies, including dynamic monarchianism, Arianism, Nestorianism, the Paulicians of Armenia, etc. These early Christian movements basically maintained that Jesus' relationship to God was like that of an adopted son to his adoptive father, not like a begotten son to his begetting father. Now this position is more or less consistent with Islamic thought, which views Jesus as being a man, albeit a man who was a prophet and messenger of God, and who thus stood in a special relationship with God. The adoptionist trajectory in early Christianity begins with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, peace be upon him. According to most adoptionists, it was at this moment that Jesus moved into his special relationship with God, not at his conception, not at his birth. With regard to the baptism of Jesus, the account in the Gospel of Luke is especially relevant. Unfortunately, once again, if you pick up most versions of the Bible, they have not gone back to the earliest source material when they did their translation. And you'll hear something like this. Jesus was baptized, came up out of the water, the heavens opened, and a voice came down from heaven and said, You are my son in whom I am well pleased. However, if you go back to the oldest sources, and this again is documented in appropriate footnotes, to the Revised Standard Version and New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The oldest Greek manuscripts and quotations from Luke render the key verse in question as follows. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, Today I have begotten you. Luke 3, verses 21 through 22. Today I have begotten you. Begotten at the time of the baptism, not at the time of conception. Well, given that Jesus was clearly an adult at the time of his baptism, under this ancient reading of Luke, begotten, must be understood metaphorically, not physically or literally. There's simply no other way to understand it. In other words, the sonship of Jesus was a created relationship, not a begotten relationship. Furthermore, before the contemporary Christian rejects this probably original wording of Luke 3, verse 22, he or she should consider that this exact wording is also to be found in the biblical books of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5, and Acts 13 verse 33, and what are obvious references to the baptism of Jesus. The same wording is also to be found in Psalms 2 verse 7, in reference to David, peace be upon him. And it's also recorded in the Gospel according to the Ibionites, the latter of which reads as follows. When the people were baptized, Jesus also came and was baptized by John. And as he came up from the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that descended and entered into him. And a voice sounded from heaven that said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And again, I have this day begotten you. The Gospel of the Indianites is quoted by Epiphanius and Panarin. Given this scriptural legacy, it's not surprising that adoptionism was a potent force within early Christianity from the first through the seventh centuries. In fact, one can trace the chronological trajectory of adoptionism with some precision. As early as the first century, the adoptionist position was a key doctrine of the Indianites, 
who maintained that Jesus became the Messiah and the adopted Son of God at his baptism, and that this was secondary to Jesus having obeyed the laws of Moses. As mentioned previously, the Ibionite movement began around the year 70 and continued as a force well into the 4th century, having spread to Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt. Around 160 to 170, Theodotus the Gnostic preached a Gnostic branch of adoptionist theory throughout Turkey. Influenced by Valentinus, Theodotus taught that Jesus was a man who was created by God and who was united with God in a special relationship at the baptism in order to bring gnosis or knowledge to man. Around 189, Theodotus the Tanner traveled from Byzantium to Rome where he propounded an adoptionist position that maintained that Jesus was a mere man, although miraculously conceived. According to this Theotodus, Jesus was a metaphorical son of God only to the extent that God granted him divine wisdom and power at his baptism. Despite being excommunicated by Pope Victor I, Theodotus acquired numerous followers who continued his adoptionist preaching, which began to be known as Theodotianism, or dynamic monarchianism. This movement lasted well into the third century, being supported by Artemon of Rome, among others. Around 260, Paul of Samosata, the Bishop of Antioch, mind you, advanced the adoptionist position once again. Paul held that Jesus was a man who was born of Mary, through whom God spoke his word, and that Jesus was divine only to the extent that he was the human vehicle through whom God spoke. As a result of Paul's preaching this adoptionist doctrine, at least three different church councils were held at Antioch to debate his orthodoxy. The first two found him orthodox. Only the third council in 268 deposed Paul from his episcopacy. Nonetheless, it took an additional four years to depose him in fact because of the support that he received from Zenobia, the Queen of Palmyra. Despite having been finally deposed, Paul's adoptionist message was picked up by his followers who later evolved into the Paulicians of Armenia, a Christian movement active as late as the 7th century. <coughs> a half century later, the adoptionist position in early Christianity reached its zenith under the teachings of Arius. Arius had been born around the year 250 in Libya, had been ordained into the priesthood, and became a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt. His adoptionist teachings were often uncannily in line with later Islamic thought on the nature of Jesus and the nature of God. For example, Arius taught that God is absolutely unique and incomparable, is alone, self-existent, unchangeable, and infinite, and must be understood in terms of his absolute oneness. Given this all-important first premise, Arius concluded that, one, the life of Jesus is portrayed in the biblical gospels, demonstrates that Jesus was not self-existent, that he changed and grew over time, if in no other way than passing through the stages of birth, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, and that he was finite, having a definite time of conception and birth. Therefore, two, Jesus was God's created being, who was called into existence out of nothingness, who could not have shared in the absolute uniqueness, immutability, and infinity of the Godhead without compromising them, who could not have been of the same substance as God without compromising the oneness of God, and who could have had no direct knowledge of God other than that which God chose to reveal to him. Well, Arianism was published about 323 in Arius's poetic work, Thalia, and quickly grew in popularity, spreading throughout the Middle East with amazing rapidity, 
in part due to the many songs that popularized Arianism to the Christian laity. It was due to the rapid rise of Arianism, the Synod at Alexandria met in September of 323 and formally excommunicated Arius. However, this excommunication was promptly reversed at the Synod of Bithynia in October of 323. Finally, Emperor Constantine was forced to convene the Council of Nicaea in May of 325, which formalized the doctrine that Jesus was of one substance with the Father. Arius refused to sign this creed and was then branded as a heretic. However, the Arian position within Christianity was so strong that Constantine was forced to reinstate Arius at the Synod of Jerusalem in 335. Later that year, Arius died at Constantinople. However, that was hardly the end of Arianism within early Christianity. Quite simply, despite the verdict of the Council of Nicaea, Arianism was probably the dominant Christology within 4th century Christianity. Many bishops had refused to attend the Council of Nicaea, and many others recounted their vote at Nicaea once they were safely back home and removed from Constantine's force of arms. As an example, we can turn to Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was successively the Bishop of Veritus and Nicomedia. Eusebius vehemently rejected the doctrine that Jesus and God were of one substance and led the Arian opposition at the Council of Nicaea before being forced to sign off on the doctrine under force of arms. Safely back home, he renewed his alliance with Arius and was then exiled to Gaul by Constantine. However, even in exile, Eusebius continued to lead the Arian charge until his death around the year 342. In response to the continued growth of Arianism, despite the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Antioch in 341 released a new creed that omitted any mention of Jesus and God being of one substance. Furthermore, 16 years later, the Council of Sirmium in 357 endorsed the Arian position that Jesus was unlike the Father or God. Only in 381 CE at the Second Council of Constantinople was the Arian position finally laid to rest and repudiated by the ecclesiastical structure of the Church with the issuance of the so-called Nicene Creed. By this way, this is a mistake almost all Muslims make, and for that matter, most Christians. They believe the Nicene Creed is recited in Sunday morning worship services was issued by the Council of Nicaea in 325. It was not. It was issued by the Second Council of Constantinople in the year 381. Well, notwithstanding this ecclesiastical dismissal of Arianism at the Council of Constantinople, Arianism continued to flourish in many Christian areas and was a potent force within some Germanic tribes until the end of the 7th century. Even today, Arianism continues to be influential in the Unitarian movement and among the Jehovah Witnesses who regard Arius as the forerunner of their founder, Charles Taze Russell. So by the late 4th century, adoptionism is still being represented by the Ibionites, the Paulicians of Armenia, and the Arians. However, the 5th century saw yet another adoptionist movement gain widespread popular support. Nestorius was born late in the 4th century at Maris, Turkey. He studied under Theodore, the bishop of Mopsuantia, entered the monastery at St. Eupropius, and was ordained a priest and became a celebrated thinker and theologian. In 428 CE, he became the bishop and patriarch of Constantinople, arguably the second highest position in all of Christendom, secondary only to the Pope. And of course, according to the Greek Orthodox Church, equal to the Pope. On Christmas Day in 428 CE, Nestorius began a series of sermons that were to rock Christendom. Among other things, Nestorius argued 
that the Virgin Mary should no longer be given the title of Theotokos. Literally translated, it means God-bearer, but it's more frequently translated as Mother of God. And the Nestorius maintained that the use of that title compromised the full humanity of Jesus, whom he appeared to see as a man who had been adopted by God. At the Council of Ephesus in 431 CE, Nestorius' teachings were condemned and he was deposed from his episcopacy. He later died around 451 in Panapolis, Egypt. However, despite his death, the adoptionist teachings of Nestorius continued to grow in influence, giving rise to Nestorian Christianity. As such, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 CE had once again to condemn Nestorius and his teachings. However, this condemnation did little good in suppressing the Nestorian position. In February of 486 CE, Barsimus, the Metropolitan of Nisibus, named Theodore of Mopsuentia, who was the chief Nestorian theologian, as the guardian of right faith in the Persian church. And at that point, the Persian church, which was independent from Rome, became officially Nestorian. Furthermore, Nestorian Christianity succeeded in gaining control of the theological school at Edessa. Preaching a doctrine that presents Jesus as a God-inspired prophet rather than as an incarnation of God, Nestorian Christianity continued to grow and flourish into the 6th century CE. In fact, by the end of the 5th century CE, there were seven metropolitan provinces in Persia and several episcopacies in Arabia and India. During the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, Nestorian Christianity continued to flourish in China. To this day, there are small pockets of Nestorian Christians to be found in Iraq, Syria, and Iran, although they appear to have strayed from the original teachings of their church. In summary, early Christianity was quite conflicted about the issue of the nature of Jesus. The various adoptionist positions within early Christianity were numerous and at times dominant. One can even speculate that Arian and Nestorian Christianity might well, very well be an extremely sizable source within Christianity today if it were not for the fact that these two branches of Christianity, which were located primarily in the Middle East and in North Africa, were so similar to the Islamic teaching regarding the nature of Jesus that they quite naturally were absorbed into Islam beginning in the 7th century. I've been noticing several people sort of leaving and I also noticed we're getting some bored faces. So inshallah, I'm going to skip the fourth issue. And uh, I see smiles of relief coming from the audience. Suffice it to say, we can find strands within early Christianity that are consistent with Islamic teachings and are at variance with contemporary Christianity. These strands, we can go back clear to the, four, to the first century, we can trace them through the Bible, we can trace them through church history, and we can see them continue and flourish into the fourth and at times seventh, eighth, and ninth centuries. As to all that I have said, God knows best. May God guide us all and may the blessings and mercy of God be upon us. None that we can find. Yes, but, but in all fairness here, when we say version of the Bible, we need to understand that what we're talking about is simply different translations. So, you know, the King James Version is one translation. The uh, Jerusalem Bible is another translation. The key question, though, is how far back did they go in the Greek manuscripts? The King James Bible didn't go very far back at all. The New Revised Standard Version goes as far back as possible. Uh, and it's, that's, that's why we get some different readings occasionally. Because we can see in that process about when the verse was all. I, I think it, it's uh, almost uh, without doubt that the, uh, the king of Ethiopia was an adoptionist Christian. And being an adoptionist Christian, hey, you know. The only difference was, as he would say, you know, the thickness of a line you could draw, draw in the dirt. Uh, there was no essential difference. 
We could the adoption of well, well, the Old Testament basically conforms to uh, the Jewish scriptures. Um, why don't people go back and, and get the... If you go to a really good seminary, you're going to be taught to go back. And you're going to be exposed to these earliest sources and these earliest versions. You're going to be taught when something was altered, where it was altered, why it was altered. Um, however, only ministers get that education. Now, this raises a serious problem for the church. Uh, and certainly a serious problem for ministers. In my graduating class from Harvard Divinity School, over roughly half of us said, no way, we're not going into the active ministry by the time that we had completed our studies. Um, there was no way, speaking personally, that I could stand behind a pulpit on Sunday morning and preach a sermon that I knew was at variance with the actual taproot of Christianity. However, if I stood behind that same pulpit on Sunday morning and preached what I knew to be true, given my seminary education, I'd be looking for a new job within a week. Okay? Now, a major survey was done by Psychology Today magazine back in the early 1970s, and they listed 10 fundamental beliefs of Christianity, and they went out and surveyed the American public as to how many of those 10 people actually believed. And amongst the Christian laity, it, they averaged a little over seven of the ten that were actually believed. Among the ordained ministers, it was a little under four. That's what happens when you get an education. Well, the Jews were the sons of Israel. There were Samaritans living there. They were not considered to be uh, Jewish. They, they were considered sort of a mongrelized group of people. Uh, there were some Canaanites living there, and I, I read the one passage, you know, where Jesus refused to even talk to the woman because she was well, a Canaanite. The teachings of Jesus, Jesus was spent, sent only to the children of Israel. Christianity, you know, the disciples didn't call themselves Christians. That term first arose in the Antioch church of, of the Gentiles. Uh, in fact, Rabbi, Rabbi Gamaliel, who was president of the Jewish Sanhedrin in the first century, ruled that the Jerusalem church, James and the disciples of Jesus, that they were authentically Jewish. They weren't seen as a separate religion. They were seen as a reforming movement within Judaism. Well, Christians believe that Jesus was born from the Virgin Mary, that it was a miraculous conception, uh, and that he was the begotten Son of God. Though, then it gets sticky because the Bible says it was the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary, not the Father. But nonetheless, that gets us into some Trinitarian. Yeah, Christian, but the usual Christian belief is in terms of the Trinity, which is defined as una substantia tre persona, one substance, three persons. The one substance is what makes it monotheistic. Now. From an Islamic perspective, boy, that's really stretching the bounds of monotheism when you talk about three persons. But it's still monotheism because of that one substance. Uh, but again, a, a type of monotheism that we as Muslims can never subscribe to.